as if everyone's aware of this, this website is uh, updated and uh, run by the uh, local uh, consultants in Glasgow, www.paindata.org. Um, the reason I draw your attention to it, it's got some quite handy uh, things for you. Um, the mo probably the most significant of these is a, an opioid dose converter, um, where if you've got patients on or taking a variety of things or a single agent and you want to do a, a conversion, you can put in the, uh, the doses of all the drugs and then it will give you a nice handy uh, conversion with a 25% dose reduction. So it's quite a handy thing uh, to, and there's lots of other resources, including all these uh, talks um, uploaded to this website. So if you ever miss any, you can always come back and refresh. So. Um, I asked to give a, an update on uh, the drugs and medications that we use uh, in the chronic pain service. Um, I'm just going to whiz through and touch on most of them and with a bit of uh, kind of focus on up-to-date guidelines, particularly the sign guideline and what uh, is recommended. Um, so before going through that, I'll just quickly go through a bit of the kind of history of analgesia. Um, the three pictures here, the one on the, l on the left is the uh, willow tree, um, the bark of which uh, spawned the advent of aspirin. Um, the picture in the middle is coal tar, and uh, that is, was the sort of precursor to uh, paracetamol, eventually. Um, and on the right we've got uh, poppies, which we all know is where opium and morphine came from. So, opioids, Earliest reference is about 3000 BC. A uh, Sumerian civilization, who were um, an advanced civilization around the Euphrates River, uh, the Persian Gulf, um, referred to it as a joy plant, so it was recreational before it was uh, medicinal. Um, ancient Greeks used it for both medicinal and recreational purposes. And then it's a long time uh, between then and this. Uh, relatively modern era uh, where they uh, imported this laudanum uh, into Europe which was opium with 40% alcohol, uh, the Jager bomb of the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it was used obviously medicinally as well but uh, often for recreational and misuse purposes. Um, morphine was isolated from opium in the 1800s and then the late 1800s um, Bayer, uh, German company, manufactured diamorphine as the non-addictive <laughs> alternative to morphine uh, called heroin and it was discovered to be more potent and more addictive. Um, so this is mentioned, um, it goes back to uh, 1500 BC, Egyptians noticed that the fever reducing qualities of the willow bark, Hippocrates used uh, willow powder to treat headache, then uh, extracted salicin from willow bark, which then got a synthetic version, acetylsalicylic acid again, made by Bayer, um, which is this apparent non-steroidal. Um, Anilines, which is, is a origins of paracetamol. It's a drug dispensing error, which uh, for treating intestinal worms, um, they discovered that coal tar was an effective um, at reducing fever. Bayer were a dye producing company and they used lots of coal tar, there was coal tar waste products and so they, they wondered what they could do with it and they developed uh, phenacetin and that was, the, that was the change of the Bayer's company from being a dye producing company to be a, a medicinal uh, company. Um, acetaminophen was developed but found not to be as effective as other agents but it really became popular when concerns about uh, GI side effects of aspirin grew. Um, and those are the three, been a sort of mainstay of our analgesics for, uh, for many years. We're all be familiar with the WHO analgesic ladder, which um, was developed in the 1990s, um, by the clock prescribing, giving the right drug, the right dose at the right time. It's an inexpensive strategy. It's very effective. It's developed for uh, treating cancer pain. Um, it's been adopted into treating all sorts of, sorts of pain. Um, but you see, there's only three steps really on this ladder. Um, it's not very versatile, and if it's if you're ineffective at stage two, they're straight on to strong opioids, which is a, a dangerous place to be. 
there's a different versions of the analgesic ladder, um, and there's, uh, I don't know if you can read the text at the bottom, but there's um, a new model which is an analgesic platform. So at the bottom there's treatments which involve no medication, and if you have to use sort of uh, non-opioid medications, there are uh, other treatments available, things like physiotherapy, psychology, these kind of things, and then you can take it up and up, but there's more options at each level, and that's probably a more um, appropriate model for uh, today's era. So we're just going to go through the um, sort of principles of pharmacological management of, of pain, and um, drug treatment or pharmacological management is really only one piece of the pie. Um, it's important to discuss limitations of treatment with patients, um, try and find out their expectations, um, if patients are expecting complete pain relief and the drug only gives them 30% pain relief, then they might view it as a failure and you view it as a success. So it's important to manage expectations. Um, being aware of the efficacy side effects, review your patient regularly, reassess and offer reassurance. Um, and an important strategy we quite often see in the pain clinic is patients on multiple analgesics, all of which they describe as being ineffective. Um, and they may well have been effective at some stage, but if a drug treatment is ineffective, uh, it's wise to discontinue it if, if you can. So I've not even talked about any drugs yet. I'm just going to mention a bit about uh, physiology of pain. Um, there's uh, four main processes. and that Transduction is where a physical or chemical <coughs> or uh, heat stimulus is turned into an electrical signal, which is transmitted to the um, central nervous system into this, the uh, dorsal horn, crosses over up the spinal thalamic tract where it's uh, perceived, and then there's uh, descending um, modulation from uh, higher centres. And all, these are all areas where we can interfere with the pain process pharmacologically. So I'm going to talk about a um, variety of agents, topical agents, non-opioids, opioids, opioids uh, anticonvulsants and antidepressants. And these are the broad categories of, of drugs that we would, we would use. Um, also going to mention a little bit about interactions and uh, as we go through, talk about some of the guidelines that are available. It's very, I, um, my background is actually in uh, primary care um, and I know how limited it can be with uh, things which are formulary and non-formulary. So as we go through the talk, I've got two symbols. If it's NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, without a cross that's in the formulary, it's got a cross, it's not. And if there's any special things, there'll be a wee sort of brackets next to it. Okay. So, um, topical analgesics, there's a range of options. Um, capsaicin, there are three different strengths. Uh, low strength creams, which are 0 0.025 uh, and 0 0.075. Generally speaking, the lower strength cream um, is aimed at being sort of anti nociceptive for osteoarthritis and uh, these sort of things. Um, the slightly stronger cream is um, generally meant to be more anti -neuro neuropathic, but they're kind of both the same when you look at the, the, the studies. There's a much stronger preparation. Uh, which is an 8% patch called Cotenza. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about them. Um, I'm not going to really talk about ruby fashions. They're in the uh, sign guidelines, but there's um, not a great deal of evidence to, to show that they're of, of good effect. Um, lidocaine patch is something we quite often use. We'll talk a bit about that. Talk a bit about topical NSAIDs. And uh, I've mentioned gabapentin as a topical treatment. There's weird... They didn't use it in Glasgow, but in um, Fourth Valley they were doing a trial of using gabapentin uh, cream and there's evidence that it's uh, useful in vulva dinner. Um, so that might come up in the future. So capsaicin is the active ingredient of uh, chilli peppers and is a selective uh, agonist at the TRIP-V1 receptors on nociceptors and A-delta and C-fibres. It's, um, it's a novel treatment. Um, it can be quite difficult to sell to a patient sometimes. So you're going to put chilli pepper on my skin, okay. What I often say to patients at, at clinic, um, I'm not sure how effective it is, but 
if they know someone who can eat hot curries, and perhaps they can't, um, it's, that is, if they can eat really hot curries, they've been desensitising those receptors over a number of years, and that's what this, the effect we're trying to get with using capsaicin cream, is continuous stimulation of these receptors to uh, sort of down-regulate them, and you get neural degradation. And I'll show you um, a, just a picture of that. So this is uh, um, you know, a radio-labeled uh, microscope picture of a uh, of the skin, and that's the baseline showing up the uh, nerve fibres, and then this is seven days following treatment with um, a cadenza patch. You can see that the the number and the, um, uh, the amount of neural tissue is actually less, and it's receded from the epidermis. So we know in a lab that it, it definitely works. Um, okay, so the the low dose cream, the 0 0.025 and 0 0.75, is uh, in the formulary. There are very few controlled trials. The evidence shows that there is a benefit over placebo in patients with osteoarthritis, so it can be useful. Uh, for osteoarthritis of the knees or osteoarthritis of uh, the hand joints. Um, there's conflicting evidence about neuropathic pain. Um, so this same guideline doesn't actually make a recommendation for use in neuropathic pain for the low-dose cream. But a recent Cochrane review um, of, this, of six studies suggests that there is some benefit in, in neuropathic pain with the, either of the low-dose creams with a number needed to treat of about six. Um, so we'll, we'll often use uh, capsaicin cream as an option, given that it's, apart from a, uh, perhaps a skin irritant effect, there's a very low side effect profile. Um, so even in patients who might not get a huge benefit, we'll still uh, give them a trial. Um, high dose patch is, um, is recommended in the sign guidelines uh, and having a significant benefit over placebo, particularly in post neuralgia, uh, with a number needed to treat of seven. Also, HIV neuropathy with a low number needed to treat. Um, but despite the benefit, which can be long-lasting, um, it's expensive and needs specialist uh, initiation and application, normally in a day hospital setting. Um, we usually apply it by first marking out the area of of pain, applying some uh, local anaesthetic cream first of all because it's very, very irritant. And we use the local anaesthetic cream to go beyond the margins of the area where it's sore. We then apply the cream, apply the patch with gloves <laughs> um, and then leave it on. There's, even using local anaesthetic cream, some patients will find it intolerable very quickly um, and we'll try and reassure them. Um, but in some patients, we just have to take it off. Take it off. Uh, others uh, tolerate it a bit better. Um, so it's a useful, useful treatment for post-hepatic neuralgia and HIV neuropathy, and we've got more experience using it in, in post-hepatic neuralgia. Um, lidocaine patch, 5% uh, plaster. That's in the formulary, but it's listed under a specialist initiation. Um, it's got a dual, a dual effect. It blocks sodium channels, so interrupts uh, pain transmission from nociceptor to the central nervous system. Um, but it's also quite cooling and soothing. I don't know if anyone's ever tried one. I had uh, one put on my arm and it's, it's really quite nice. Um, <laughs> and I can imagine if, if something's sore uh, that, that you know, it's a treatment that patient, patients would like. Um, it's really, it's licensed for post neuralgia, which uh, there's significant benefits over placebo, but there's not really any real evidence for uh, other indications, um, or limited evidence for other indications. But we will find that we suggest it from time to time for, for patients um, who don't have post neuralgia, uh, have other neuropathic pain conditions. Um, and probably the reason for that is it's got a very low side effect profile. It is. Um, a treatment which patients do like, um, and if it avoids us uh, going for a strong opioid, then um, it can be quite can be useful. But then it's only in the formulary for post neuralgia, so um, maybe that will expand in the future. You can apply 
up to three plasters, and it's a two hours on, two hours off uh, treatment. So practicalities of using it, um, for example, if you want, if you put it on your foot, it's probably quite difficult to put it on during the day. So um, I'll ask patients to maybe put it on uh, at night time. So there can be different wee practical things which you need to be sorted out to use it. Um, sign guidelines recommend it for use in post hepatic neuralgia, but only when other first line therapies have failed and they don't give a recommendation for any other indications. Um, topical non steroidals, uh, most evidence is for topical diclofenac, but that's not in the formulary. Um, what is in the formulary is, is paroxicam and ketoprofen. Um, there's little difference in efficacy with a topically applied non steroidal compared to to oral and they've got a better GI side effect profile, uh, which is comparable to placebo. So for patients who have um, <coughs> sort of upper, you know, reflux or upper GI uh, symptoms, it's uh, an appropriate uh, appropriate treatment. Um, and they recommend it for use, particularly when an, an oral NSAID is not, not tolerated. Um, but obviously it's probably only useful for particular areas of the body if someone's got widespread musculoskeletal pain, you can't expect them to put cream everywhere. So again, it's got its own sort of practical uh, implications. So we talk about some tablets now. Um, particularly mentioned non-opioid analgesics, paracetamol, non steroidals again, COX-2 inhibitors and uh, nephipam. Um, I'm not going to mention nephipam any, really anymore. It's not in the uh, What's mentioned in the sign guidelines, but there's no um, studies or or anything to kind of back up its its use, and it can be misused. So nephipam is something which wouldn't be recommended as a as a useful choice for non-opioid analgesics. But paracetamol um, is useful. Um, it's a central cyclooxygenase inhibitor, so reduces central prostaglandins, and that's how it exerts its pain-killing and antipyretic effect, although no one's actually proved that um, satisfactorily. Um, it doesn't really have a peripheral anti-inflammatory ac action, um, and it's in the formulary, as you would expect, very cheap uh, medication, but it's uh, the tablet is preferred. You know that the effervescent dispersible ones are um, sort of discouraged, but part of the reason for that is it's the effervescent dispersible ones have got a very high sodium content of eight grams, and if you that's um, higher than the recommended daily intake of, of sodium. So if you've got a patient who's hypertensive and you're they're wanting effervescent uh, tablets, that could be one way to um, discourage them from from it. Is to say, you know, this is such a high sodium content, where it's going to be counterproductive in treating your hypertension. Um, but they should only be really reserved for people who have uh, proper swallowing difficulties. And the same guidelines that, uh, indicate there's a small benefit over placebo for osteoarthritis and that they're recommended that it should be considered either alone or in combination um, with non steroids for osteoarthritis. Non steroidals, um, primary action is an inhibition of cyclooxygenase and there's two versions of the cyclooxygenase enzyme, one being the constitutive enzyme, uh, two being the inducible form. Um, the constitutive one is protective in the GI tract and you know, uh, it's also protective for your kidneys and the, the prostaglandins are important for renal vascular tone um, and also expressed in, in platelets, important in platelet aggregation. Um, the enzyme that's blocked in, for non steroidals is the cyclooxygenase enzyme on the, on the left. It blocks production of prostaglandins, prostacyclins and thromboxanes. But this is the, the whole pathway. You can see if you block that pathway, probably there's more substrate going down the opposite pathway, uh, producing more leukotrienes. And this is thought to be the mechanism why you get um, uh, exacerbations of asthma for uh, patients who are, who are sensitive to, to non-steroidals. Okay. So this is probably a wee bit more information than we need, um, but this is just a diagram of how a non-selective 
uh, non-steroidal inhibits the enzyme. Um, it's a small molecule we can get inside uh, both COX-1 and COX-2 and block arachidonic acid, whereas uh, the COX-2s, for example, celecoxib is quite a, it's a big molecule, it can't get into COX-1, uh, but it can get into COX-2, and that's how it selectively differentiates between the two. Um, you've heard about this study about um, rofocoxib. It was a big study to look at the side effects um, of rofocoxib compared to naproxen, and it's the main reason why uh, rofocoxib was uh, withdrawn, although it showed that there was less GI complications with uh, the COX-2 inhibitor rofocoxib. There was a f four times increase in myocardial infarction, although the overall mortality rate was, was similar. Um, it was eventually withdrawn and other non-steroidals and COX-2 inhibitors are also shown to have increased risk of uh, myocardial infarction, cardiac death, um, but naproxen seems to be the exception, so naproxen appears to be uh, safe in that regard. Side effects, well, oh, are you familiar with the side effects? Gastric complications, bleeding, um, as I just mentioned, coronary heart disease, renal impairment, bronchospasm, um, there's other miscellaneous things. Same guidelines would suggest that there's modest, modest, modest benefit uh, patients with low back pain and musculoskeletal pain compared to placebo, but the important thing is to consider gastrointestinal cardiac risk before commencing. And it's quite common to prescribe a proton pump inhibitor um, there's no guidance on who should have a proton pump inhibitor um, to cover non steroidals but that it, generally if they're over 65, certainly should. Um, if they've got a history of reflux or ulcer or GI symptoms, we would. Um, and if you've been, if you're prescribing the maximum dose, which is commonly ibuprofen, say 400 milligrams, but if you're given uh, 600 or 800 milli milligrams, certainly give a, a proton pump inhibitor to cover that or for a prolonged period. So if you're prescribing non for uh, for several weeks, um, we'd certainly uh, co-prescribe a proton pump inhibitor. Um, so what's on? So there's lots of NSAIDs on the formula, I didn't list them all, but the, the preferred list includes these three. Ibuprofen has got the lowest GI side effect profile of the non-selective NSAIDs and is, is also um, one of the more useful ones from a pain point of view. Naproxen is at the lowest risk of cardiac events, so if someone's going on that long term, um, it's a useful uh, one to consider. And celecoxib um, is, the, is a selective COX-2 inhibitor uh, on the preferred list, although um, it's generally reserved for patients with uh, inflammatory joint conditions. Okay, so we're on to opiates. Uh, so opiate or opioid? Opiate is a naturally occur occurring substance and an opioid is a broader term which includes all, uh, all substances including synthet synthetic ones. We've all got an endogenous opioid system which is important for uh, a number of functions, uh, okay. no less all these functions. So um, it's important for uh, pain perception, for sleep regulation, uh, stress, gastrointestinal function, your immune system, uh, helps you to learn, helps you feel good, gives you, um, it's important in uh, controlling your appetite. Um, it's also, although I didn't dare put a Google image on, it's important, important in sexual function as, as well. Um, so you can see the range of uh, functions which can um, out of control if someone develops a problem with, with uh, opioid um, misuse. So there are various opioid receptors, um, most of them regulate some, some analgesia, mu opioid receptors responsible for physical dependence. Um, the only reason I mention the receptors is that there's a, another type of opioid receptor called nociceptin. Um, it's very similar to the classical opioid receptors, but it has pro-nociceptive and anti-analgesic effects. Um, it's got a role in tolerance to opioids, and it's an area which will be of interest probably quite far into the future in the treatment of pain um, to 
do to develop nociceptin ag uh, antagonists, uh, which hope, uh, hoping would, would either treat pain on their own, um, help with uh, sort of treatment of tolerance, or used together with an opioid to reduce the, the overall dose of an opioid. So that they're kind of in the pipeline for the future. Um, tolerance is a big problem with opioid analgesics and it's defined as a decrease in the pharmacological response following repeated or prolonged administration. It can be metabolic as in you metabolise the, the drug differently over time or it can be functional, it can be cellular mechanisms and adaptations which mean that the drug is less effective over time. That might be internalisation of receptors or changes within the cells themselves. Um, and this is just a, a graph of opioid receptor sensitivity over time and then uh, a graph of uh, tolerance and a dose response. So even after, after a week this tolerance will start to, to develop and you can still get the same response, but to get the same response, there needs to be a higher concentration of the of the drug, and that's one of the major drawbacks of, of opioids. Um, most of them undergo phase one metabolism in the liver. Morphine doesn't. Um, the reason I mentioned metabolism is that um, it can lead to polymorphisms of uh, or inter-individual vari variability in the, the way things are metabolized, particularly with uh, codeine, you'll be aware of rapid metabolizers get quite a good analgesic response to codeine and poor metabolizers get a poor analgesic response and this is down to uh, cytochrome P450-2DEA um, and that enzyme is inhibited by SSRIs um, so if someone's, there's quite a lot of patients are on citalopram, fluoxetine and that can interfere with how they uh, metabolize certain drugs okay. and excreted renally so um, metabolites which are kind of active and hydrophilic can lead to uh, toxicity. So morphine, if someone's got renal failure, mor morphine is probably quite a bad choice. Lipophilic drugs um, with inactive metabolites are probably more effective or more appropriate. Um, okay, and these are the varied. I'm going to skip past that. Okay, so desirable qualities of a, an opioid would be one which. Uh, from a chronic pain pers perspective, a long-acting preparation. Um, immediate release preparations are more prone to misuse, um, can increase your risk of, uh, or accelerate tolerance um, and dependence. Um, we want one which is effective at a low dose and choose preparations which are, have a low potential for, for misuse. So, so long-acting tablets, transdermal and certainly no injectable uh, therapies. The common preparations which you use, uh, codeine, weak opioid, which you've mentioned has variable metabolism, uh, the hydrocodeine, again weak opi opioid in the formulary, uh, tramadol is in the formulary but it's not first line, it's got a separate uh, mode of action which is noradrenaline reuptake inhibition, um, an enhanced serotonin release which can be useful in neuropathic pain. MST and oxycodone are probably the mainstay of the strong opioids that we would use. Um, the morphine's cheap, 12 hourly dosing and um, reliable. Oxycodone um, has got a better bioavailability than, than MST. Other preparations, um, which you use transdermal preparations. Fentanyl, again, it's in the formula but not first line. Buprenorphine. Um, or butrans patches are some, something which we will recommend fairly regularly, probably less regularly now than, than, we, than we did, but they are not in the, the formula, formulary. Um, attraction of using buprenorphine is that there are doses which are uh, you know, a bit stronger than, than what you would be able to offer in a weak opioid, but not as strong as, as going for a, a full step three opioid so it's kind of a nice middle ground um, and a transdermal as well so low low risk of uh, or low potential for misuse um, but the, that has its own controversy because they're not they're not in the in the formulary and quite often we might suggest them when they're not being prescribed we can talk about that at the end um, Tepentadol is, is in the is 
been started in, in uh, listed in the formulary as a specialist initiation, and that's um, again it's got noradrenaline reuptake in it. So it's, if you can imagine, it's a bit like tramadol, but instead of being a step two opioid, it's a step three opioid. Um, we've got a little bit of experience using that, and it's um, reserved for patients who have been on one, uh, been on at least two uh, opioids before, either. MST and OxyContin or MST and fentanyl and had uh, problems either with them being ineffective or uh, intolerable side effects. Um, and we've had probably about 30 to 40% success rate uh, with Tepentadol. Um, methadone is not something we use frequently at all. It's got an extra um, effect of being an NMDA antagonist. Um, but I certainly don't have a lot of um, experience using using methadone, but we occasionally do do use it. Um, what does it say in the same guidelines? S does suggest we should be um, using s strong opioids uh, or considering them for patients who have uh, long-term painful conditions such as low back pain and osteoarthritis. But the important thing is to start them as a trial on a trial basis and only to continue them where there's ongoing pain relief and that involves regular review um, and at the regular review there needs to be a system in place to pick up signs of misuse um, and so we've in Glasgow we've got uh, the GGC uh, opioid prescribing guideline which is available on the pain data website and I think uh, it should have been disseminated throughout primary care um, and it really ref reflects a lot of the stuff in the, the BPS guideline uh, opioids for, for persistent pain. Okay, so moving on to other medications which we frequently use, anticonvulsants, um, useful in treating neuropathic pain, which is divine, de uh, uh, defined as pain resulting from a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system broadly fall under two categories. There's calcium channel blockade, which is gabapentin in the formulary, free to use, and pregabalin, again, which is in the formulary but not listed as being a first-line agent. Um, the other uh, broad category are uh, sodium channel blockers, of which carbamazepine is one which we would occasionally, occasionally use, but mostly for treating trigeminal neuralgia. Um, so it's gabapentin, uh, it's now commonly used, it's superior to placebo uh, as long as you're given daily doses of at least um, 1200 milligrams, number needed to treat of 6.8 for a broad category of, of neuropathic pain conditions, post diabetic neuralgia, painful diabetic neuropathy um, and mixed neuropathic pain. There is some evidence of benefit in fibromyalgia, although there's no firm recommendation. Um, and this sign guidelines on this that it should be considered for patients with uh, neuropathic pain, so broad, broadly speaking, uh, it's a general neuropathic pain. Um, adverse effects, one of the important things about adverse effects with gabapentin is they often occur first before you get any analgesia. Um, dizziness, somnolence are the common ones, uh, gait disturbances as possible, but one that people are most worried about is swelling, weight gain, peripheral edema. It's about the incidence of that's about sort of eight to ten percent. Um, titrate it. There's, we've, we recommend two different titration regimes. One would be starting at 300 milligrams three times a day, increasing up to a max of uh, 3,600. Um, if they're elderly or there are concerns about side effects. If patients worried about side effects, we would say, well, let's start at 100 milligrams and titrate up in 100 milligram steps. Pregabalin is very similar um, to gabapentin, although it's more potent um, and there are possibly fewer side effects. And it's been shown to be superior to placebo at doses of, of 300 milligrams and above. Um, at doses, at the lower doses, 150 milligrams, um, it's, n it's not as effective. There's some evidence of benefit for patients with chronic pancreatitis. That's a, they're a difficult group of patients. We quite often see them at the, at the pain clinic um, and they're very difficult to treat. And the 
uh, there is some evidence coming out that they, uh, this might be a useful useful treatment in reducing the pain intensity in chronic pancreatitis. And listed in the BNF is another indication of pregabalin pre is uh, generalised anxiety disorder. Um, so that sometimes, if I'm choosing between gabapentin and pregabalin, if someone has generalised anxiety disorder which is not treated by other means, it might nudge me to say, well, let's try pregabalin in instead or, as, or first. Adverse effects are very similar. Um, again, can occur before you get a, a get analgesia. And this recent sign guidelines um, recommended that it's useful for neuropathic pain, but not as first line. And it also has a recommendation for treatment of fibromyalgia. And the titration regime for this is start 75 milligrams twice daily and increase it after uh, seven days. Um, you can start lower, and doses less than 150 are often not affected. Um, antidepressants, again, they broadly fall under three categories. Tricyclics, which amitriptyline and nortriptyline are the ones we would use the most. There's the SNRIs, um, which, of which duloxetine is the sort of drug of the moment, and uh, SSRIs, uh, fluoxetine, which is uh, it's a classical one for using in fibromyalgia. Um, the analgesic action of antidepressants is mainly due to the noradrenergic effects uh, rather than the serotonergic effects. So the tricyclics and the uh, SNRIs appear to be more effective than the, than the SSRIs. Um, these things, not surprisingly, uh, have got very little benefit uh, for things like low back pain. Um, are more useful in treating in neuropathic type pain. There is some benefit f in fibromyalgia with tricyclic antidepressants, and in particular if there's a, a sleep disturbance as a major component of the fibromyalgia, um, that's when it's probably most useful. And it's superior to placebo and a variety of uh, neuropathic pain states. As it, I'm sure you know, there's a wide range of adverse effects with tricyclic antidepressants, and that's down to multiple mechanisms of action that, that not only um, block reuptake of neuroamines, they also block uh, calcium, uh, sorry, sodium channels, and um, they've got anticholinergic effects. So there's, there's a wide range of, uh, of, of side effects, although they've got a long history of, of safety in normal doses. Nortriptyline, um, has got a better side effect profile than amitriptyline and if someone has uh, some benefit with amitriptyline but side effects are an issue, often a switch to nortriptyline uh, can be helpful. Um, same guidelines recommend we shouldn't be using them to treat uh, chronic low back pain but should be uh, considered for fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain. Um, and they've mentioned that what I just said about you know, alternative tricyclics, for example, nortriptyline, uh, can be appropriate to try and reduce the, the side effect profile. And we would normally have two, again, two titration regimes, one starting at 10 milligrams and going up in 10 milligram increments every three to seven days, or one starting at 25. And if you're worried about side effects or a patient's elderly, um, we would go for the, for the lower titration schedule. SNRIs, um, see there's probably kind of uh, drug of, of the moment. We've got, we've got uh, probably least experience with them compared to using amitriptyline and gabapentin. Um, and there are new indications coming out for, delox, for deloxetine seemingly all the time. There is evidence of it's been effective uh, in chronic low back pain. There's evidence of it being effective in fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis as well as neuropathic pain states. Um, in the, the recent sign guidelines, um, it said it should be second or third line for painful diabetic neuropathy, but it should be considered for patients with fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis. Well, it's, it's, they don't have marketing approval for it, but for use in osteoarthritis it is in the, in the guideline. Um, but we don't have a great deal of experience using it in, in osteoarthritis to say what our, our experience is. But I'm sure we'll uh, have more information on that in the future. Um, 
titration regime for this is usually 30 or 60 milligrams, up to a maximum of 120 in divided doses. So there's lots of different agents which you can use for neuropathic pain, and you really kind of wonder which which one would you go for first. You could uh, look at the sign guidelines, which suggest starting with amitriptyline and gabapentin, and then going for, if that's not effective, go for pre pregabalin as second line for gabapentin, and if they're not effective, try and duloxetine. Um, or there's NICE guidelines which suggest you can offer the patient uh, any one of amitriptyline, gabapentin, pregabalin or duloxetine. And carbamazepine's in there for really f as first line for uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, if the guys are in the clinic are different. My uh, sort of take on it is um, if the patient's got significant sleep disturbance, I would probably plump for something which is hopefully going to uh, give them a better quality of sleep, so I'm a triplet. Um, if there's generalised anxiety, um, I might go for pregabalin, or if the patient has concomitant untreated depression and you want to give a uh, decent antidepressant, then duloxetine might be use useful. It can be, um, if you start treatment with another antidepressant and then add uh, something different and you can probably you can come up with problems with interactions. So um, that's how I uh, would look at it. And if a patient has trigeminal neuralgia, I would use carbamazepine. Other agents which you can, which you can use, uh, which we've talked about, uh, Topical agents such as lidocaine patches, capsaicin, uh, and then these things at the bottom are for uh, sort of specialist input. So I put opioids in there, but you know, for neuropathic pain, we would, if we were thinking about putting someone on to step three opioids, we'd probably like to see them before that happens. Um, Catenza, we need to initiate that in the in the hospital. Uh, psychology, we've got easy uh, access to that, and neuromodulation is a, a, we can get a, a tens machine, but we're talking about um, advanced neuromodulation uh, by way of things like spinal cord stimulators, which uh, we would refer to a, a tertiary service for. Um, I don't want to spend too much on interactions, just to mention the one that we all worry about is really serotonin syndrome. Um, symptoms can be really mild, so can have a bit of agitation, headache, and you know, uh, can be a wee bit sweaty, and. It might not actually uh, be apparent as being a medication problem or a serotonin syndrome probably exists across uh, the community in quite low levels. You know, if someone's on tramadol, uh, amitriptyline and um, citalopram, uh, they could quite easily have symptoms which could be put down to other things but could, could be related to uh, an increased level of serotonin. So a simple thing to do is to, you know, if you consider it, is to look at the medications and perhaps take one of the least effective ones off. But it can obviously um, be more severe than that and in, in its worst, term, worst form can be severe life-threatening. Um, and so just to be careful when prescribing perhaps multiple uh, medications with a similar effect on, on serotonin levels. So I've rattled on about <laughs> uh, pharmacology of pain for a, for a while. I'd just like to summarise by saying really it's only part of the overall management. We'd, you know, we'd like to consider sort of alternatives and non-pharmacological therapy really before you ascend to the next level on the WHO pain ladder. I and mean, Maybe we should be considering it more as a, a pain platform. Um, tailoring therapy to the individual uh, can be useful, can take time um, you know, to get things just right, but getting uh, the patient in for regular review, reassessment and giving them reassurance would help with that. There are guidelines to, to guide us, sign if we just guidelines, NICE guidelines, BPS guidelines and we've got local guidelines. Um, and most of the options which are available, available to uh, us uh, are in the, in the GGC formulary for you to use um, and if there's anything that's not then it should be available through us in the specialist pain service. Thank you very much.